little clip there, of course, from the Flintstones kind of theme song, of course. Guys got kind of a prehistory, of course, thing to it, of course, right there. So you want to welcome you, of course, to uh, History 1113. Of course, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Glad you can, of course, join us. And uh, anywhere, uh, of course, uh, as you know, uh, this is our first week of classes, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. I uh, hope you're having a great week out there uh, overall. Uh, you know, I think we started our first, uh, I think, class on, I guess it was Monday this week, uh, where we kind of reviewed the syllabus uh, and use of Canvas. So I hope you've gone back and, you know, taken a look at that uh, already. Because, uh, you know, this is, of course, a seven weeks class. It's going to, of course, go real, real quick, you know, in the semester. So anyway, before we get started, looks like we do have a few people uh, watching right now. Uh, looks like Fernando's watching. Hey, uh, on YouTube. Uh, anybody else let me know if you're watching, of course, live out there right now. Devaney, hey, good afternoon. Uh, Roan's also watching uh, right now, also as well. Uh, on StreamYard night right now, we also got Fernando too. Dacian and Lauren are also watching, and Jennifer just joined us also uh, right now. So I hope you're having a great afternoon. Um, okay, Critesia. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Critesia looks like this is an I. I guess. Yeah, it is. So uh, anyway, um, Criticia, I guess I say that. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, uh, I want to kind of talk about a few things before we get started today, kind of get you all on pace. Uh, but uh, as of now, you don't have that many assignments out right now. But as you all know, the pretest is like, you know, preeminent as the main thing you need to get done uh, this week. Uh, I have put. I have actually uh, moved it up a day. Uh, it's going to be due tomorrow night at midnight. The pretest. So that's something you need to get done uh, if you want to remain in the class. Uh, contract policy page also needs to be turned in uh, as soon as possible uh, in Canvas. Uh, so those both those need need to be done because uh, I think the attendance is going to be due apparently by Thursday or something like that. So try to get that done. Uh, so you can remain, of course, uh, in the class. Because this is a seven weeks class, you know, so it goes much faster uh, than the regular 15 weeks or whatever. So uh, anyway, um, I think that's uh, pretty much the main announcements I know now. But uh, also remind you, too, um, don't forget, uh, I'm still taking, you know, whatever kind of book titles you're doing for your book report. So you know, keep emailing those to me, uh, what you want to do. Uh, for that particular assignment. And if, if anybody's also interested in the Veterans Project, you know, please let me know also uh, via email. So I think that's my main announcements I've got today, uh, mostly uh, overall. Now, uh, in today's lecture, you know, I'm going to be talking mainly on about the background of early humans. We'll kind of get into that because you know, early humans, they think, started in Africa and then, of course, spread into Europe and Asia, and then eventually to the Americas later uh, also as well. So I'll get into that today. Uh, I'll kind of go into kind of some of the early Neolithic culture, especially early settlements that kind of developed uh, initially in the world. And I also will kind of get into also and talk about the um, so-called river valley civilizations, which there were about four of them, of course, that developed. I'll kind of talk about the background of that because later, you know, this week and next week, we'll get more into talking about some of those civilizations like Mesopotamia and later Egypt uh, as well. So if you have any comments, questions, you know, uh, during the live stream, let me know, you know, anytime you want. Uh, but you also, you know, can anytime you want, leave comments, questions, of course, on my YouTube channel, uh, whichever lecture segment, of course, you're looking at uh, overall. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you want to join us in StreamYard, here, of course, is the link also, by the way, StreamYard.com uh, as well. I also posted the playlist for this lecture series uh, in YouTube uh, also as well. So uh, anyway, um, I'm going to, of course, first talk about, uh, of course, the background. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit of prehistory, but I think the first thing I'm, I'm usually going to talk about uh, is kind of like the difference between uh, what is, you know, history versus prehistory. I'll kind of talk about that first. I'll kind of get into like some of the background of history. I'll kind of mention a little bit about Herodotus, who is one of the fathers 
of history that kind of start starts it and all that. And um, I've got here uh, kind of this slide here. I can kind of uh, show you real quick here, but kind of showing you a difference between, you know, history uh, versus, I guess, what we call prehistory. So, yeah, what exactly is history? Uh, well, you can see there, obviously, history is a study of the past, uh, primarily, you know, dealing with civilizations, human civilizations, uh, like on the earth. Uh, obviously, they deal more with like written records, like written records that have been left behind and whatever kind of research we can use, of course, to uh, research those topics in history, more or less. Uh, so that has a lot to do with it. Um, and history is included with prehistory. You know, in fact, in fact, prehistory is more vast, if you know about that, compared to written history or civilized history um, going back millions of years, I guess. Uh, but uh, the, not, the actual development of historiography or the writing of history uh, is not really something that's developed really later uh, until the Greeks, ancient Greeks come along. They're, they're the ones that kind of start writing down history. But obviously history could be things that could have been written also, uh, like in the form of poetry, uh, plays, epic poems, you know, oral history, uh, cave art, like art, art and artifacts, I guess, left behind uh, in, in the past in general. So history can be all kinds of things, even biblical history, like the Bible or whatever, is kind of like a form of history uh, left behind uh, as well. I do have a slide on uh, the background of history. So the word history uh, evolved from the Greek Greek word uh, historia, uh, which I do have a translation of it. It means in Greek to inquiry, uh, to, I guess, discover knowledge, or I think they say truth, discover truth, uh, I guess, about the past mostly civilizations, I guess. And so that's what mostly historians are trying to do, trying to uncover or research uh, things that have happened in the past uh, a long time ago. And some of it's chronological in order. You know, obviously, in this class, we'll be, we'll be going chronologically from prehistory up through ancient times into the Middle Ages. Uh, that's pretty much the format of history. But you know, history itself might be written about a specific topic. Uh, a, specific, a specific person, a biography or whatever about a person. Uh, it could be a tale, it could be a story, obviously, but obviously mostly a record of things that have happened in the past in general. Now, um, of course, when they talk about history, you know, at least the beginning of it, like the written aspect of history, uh, you do have Herodotus. You may have heard about uh, Herodotus, of course, very important figure uh, early on in uh, the development of history. He's really considered the first major historical writer uh, in ancient times. Uh, he lived in the 5th century BC. Uh, his series of works are called different names, the histories of Herodotus or just the histories, or some people just call it the history of Herodotus, uh, were published about maybe 530 to about 540 BC. Uh, and uh, it's considered to be, I guess, the first uh, historical work of importance, which covers the time of the, when the Greeks were fighting the Persian Empire. Uh, it goes a lot into like the Greco-Persian Wars and even gives us kind of a common history of ancient Egypt at the time well, as well. Uh, he's later nicknamed the father of history, which by the way was a name that was um, given to him uh, by the uh, Roman orator. I think it was a senator named uh, Cicero. He was one of the name uh, father of history, but I wouldn't say that he was the he's the greatest you know, of the Greek historians uh, from a long time ago, because uh, some people thought he was kind of prone to exaggeration. So that's the only thing about Herodotus. I think Herodotus would sometimes even tell tales more or less, and it's not really a form of what we call scientific history, uh, where they're using definite eyewitnesses and you know, written down sources and stuff like that. So I guess if he couldn't think of something that happened, he would maybe just make it up. Because uh, I think it was Voltaire, uh, the famous French writer, who made the comment that Herodotus might have been the father of lies because some of his stories may have not been true. So or exaggerated, which a lot of the Greek, a lot of the ancient writers tend to exaggerate 
things and battles and stuff like that. All right, then you have, of course, going back to it, you have what they call prehistory, of course, uh, which, you know, uh, that's something else. You have prehistory, you know, the historical period before you have civilization, uh, before there's, you know, human records written around, not a cave art, but just, you know, actual records uh, written written down, uh, more or less. And um, you go to this here, you can see that uh, prehistory is obviously, yeah, it's it's based off of like scientific things, like scientific artifacts that have kind of been studied a long time ago. Uh, carvings, artifacts, uh, you know, bones left behind, cave art, uh, whatever it is uh, that's been left, pottery, whatever they've left behind from a long time ago. And um, so it's the, the the period before we have civilization, before written records, you know, a long time ago. And uh, prehistory relies heavily on the scientific fields, anthropology, archaeology, which broke off from anthropology, uh, geology, which studies like the earth, minerals and stone, things like that. Paleontology, study like, you know, bones and dinosaurs and things like that. Uh, human fossils, et cetera, from a long time ago. So all those are different scientific fields uh, that really study uh, into uh, what happened a long time ago. So if you go into like pre prehistoric man, like in America, you know, some of those are going to be areas that, that are pretty important, anthropology, archaeology, uh, et cetera. So here's, by the way, uh, a uh, kind of a grid here showing the differences I guess in the historical periods that break up, you know, prehistory versus history. So most of prehistory, which we'll get to today, is what they call a stone age, you know, uh, where stone was the main technology uh, used a long time ago. So you can see it goes back two, three million years ago. Uh, I think the Paleolithic age or old stone age starts about maybe two and a, two and a half million years ago. Uh, the Neolithic or New Stone Age starts about 10,000 BC, so about 12,000 years ago, uh, roughly. Now, I'll get to it later. There's a difference between the two periods of how the human culture is, how they survive, uh, and all that. Because uh, humans go from being a hunter gatherer to being like a farmer. Uh, and then you've got like later history. You've got, you know, ancient times, which uh, I guess they call it different names antiquity or ancient times. Uh, which that goes like from around the Bronze Age uh, down to like the Roman period. You got the medieval period, uh, which happens 500 to 1500 AD or whatever. Then you got your modern age from the time of like Columbus, Renaissance, uh, the period when the Reformation begins up to, I guess they say close to like 1800 or so or 1800s. Uh, and so you got the contemporary age. And I guess now we're in the, uh, so-called uh, postmodern era uh, is where is where we're at now uh, overall. So that's kind of kind of talking about you know uh, the different time periods and I'll I'll get more into the different periods, human cultural periods like Stone Age. I'll talk about the Metal Ages a little today uh, also as well because we'll get more into that later. The Metal Ages and um, but I want to first talk about like I'm talking about today, which is the development of early humans, uh, which uh, if you go to this map right here, which I'll show you, uh, you can see that uh, early humans, they believe, started in Africa. Uh, back in the area that's, I guess, more, I guess, important uh, where humans first started is the eastern part of Africa, East Africa, so-called hominins. Uh, and um, they call often Africa the so-called cradle of humankind. So humans uh, started there several million years ago. Uh, and then from there, as you see, uh, they eventually migrated uh, into other parts of the world, into Europe, uh, into uh, Asia. And then more recently, uh, you can see uh, into the Americas, because that took a while for humans to migrate there, I guess, through Alaska. Uh, and so the dating of like at least early human fossils that go back a long way, our ancestors go anywhere from like two to seven million years ago uh, overall with the oldest ones uh, primarily being, uh, like I said, in mostly East Africa. Because East Africa, 
is where a lot of the uh, early pioneering research was done on early humans. I'll talk about the leaky family and all that. They were kind of instrumental in doing that a long time ago. But they think that later humans that we're more related to, which are Homo sapiens, uh, developed more or less about 200, 200 to 300,000 years ago in Africa before they later migrated uh, in, into other continents. Uh, so it takes a while. You can see in that graph, that map there, uh, showing you all the different areas they spread into uh, over time. And I'll get to it later, but humans are kind of migrating because they're, I guess, chasing after game nomadically uh, to hunt and so on. Uh, they think that they think early ancestors of, of of humans left Africa a long time ago. They think Homo erectus, I think close to two million years ago, uh, may have left Africa at one point. At least our distant ancestors uh, from a long time ago. Uh, and uh, there's one area which I was talking about earlier where they have done a lot of research originally, which I'll show you, uh, which is, where's that picture I've got here? It's kind of interesting. But it's the uh, Old of A Gorge in Tanzania, supposedly one of the places in Africa where they found some of the oldest primate fossils, and also early human fossils uh, that, that have been found there. Uh, it's in like the east eastern part of Africa, so-called Great Rift Valley that runs from like Ethiopia, Kenya, all the way down uh, into Tanzania. Uh, and... Um, I think going back to about the mid 20th century, uh, they think that's when uh, paleoanthropologists have been, you know, started doing work there. I think it was like the Leakeys. I know Mary Lu uh, Lewis and Mary Leakey, I know, did a lot of research there on uh, Tanzania, which was originally called uh, British East, East Africa uh, at the time. Uh, and um, yeah, that's kind of where, where it all started, like that area. Uh, that you're looking at in Africa, that east east part of Africa. Uh, and then uh, also they find a lot of fossils like in, uh, you know, Kenya, Ethiopia. They found fossils back around South Africa, Chad, and pretty much all those parts of Africa. They discovered hominin, hominin fossils that go back several billion years. Now, I am going to talk about several different types of um, early human ancestors that are of course, fossil wise that they found that I'll kind of mention today. But um, I guess these are the ones that are the most famous uh, Australopithecus or Australopithecines. Of course, some of the early, they think, primates that may have been somehow related or linked to uh, later humans, which I'll talk about Lucy, one of the most famous uh, that was found uh, in Africa. Uh, Australopithecus, at least the one of Lucy, is at the top left, which is right here. Homo habilis, uh, one of the first homo genus of uh, early uh, hominins that was found like in Tanzania. Uh, of course, I'll talk about that one later. Uh, homo erectus, sometimes called Homo ergaster, uh, was another uh, type of early human ass ancestor found in Africa, later also in Europe and Asia. Uh, Neanderthal man, of course, a skull right here. Uh, and then you have your um, Homo sapiens, or, of course, we've got Cro-Magnum man with skull right there, looking at right there, uh, which Homo sapiens, of course, are the modern humans, of course, uh, that come about later. Yeah, Lucy, uh, they always talk about that one when they talk about early, you know, uh, paleoanthropology, I guess, with early hominins that might be related to humans uh, later. Uh, Lucy was a famous... Um, skeletal fossil that was found in the 1970s, 1974, uh, in Ethiopia. I think northern Ethiopia is where it was found uh, by Donald Johansson. And um, I think the um, Australopithecines were kind of broken into two types. Uh, they got Australopithecus afarensis, and they have one called Africanus uh, as well. Uh, that one, of course, Lucy is considered one of the most famous. Uh, and uh, of course, it, they think it was a a young a young female, about maybe twelve years old, uh, that had, I think they say it fallen out of a tree because they think that early uh, a lot of the early primates, you know, lived in trees, uh, probably ate mostly vegetation, not meat eaters. 
Uh, and um, they think she fell out of the tree and died. Uh, and so they later found her fossil remain. Uh, and um, the name Lucy, by the way, came from the fact that apparently after they found her uh, that day in 1974, uh, they were listening to a Beatles song you may have heard of called Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds. And so the name stuck. They called her Lucy. After they knew it's what her real name was, if she had a name, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, so yeah, that's Lucy. Uh, of course, the, the female they found uh, was only about three foot six. It was believed to be what her height was uh, when she died. At least they estimate is what it is. Uh, they do think early primates walked on all fours, mostly ate vegetation. Uh, and their brain size was maybe close to the size of a chimpanzee. So not that large uh, compared to, obviously, humans later uh, that we have. So, so and I think Lucy's important because they think Lucy might be, you know, that one of the first non-human primates that, that, or it might be somehow connected that, that broke away from the non-human primates, uh, they think later in so-called missing link maybe there. Uh, between later humans, which is still debated and all that. They found other ones too. Like there's one I know in 2001 they found uh, that's called, they call it Tumai for short. You may have heard of it called uh, Salanthropus chadensis. It was found in, uh, I think in Chad about 20 years ago. It's estimated at being like 7 million years old, but Lucy they think is like 3 to 4 million years old. They estimate how far she goes back in the fossil record. Now, the one that's real famous uh, I'll talk about today, uh, well-known, you may have heard about is Homo habilis, uh, of course, which they first started finding uh, Homo habilis uh, in the 1950s and 60s, they believe, in Africa, East Africa. Uh, and um, Homo habilis um, is considered one of the first early humans, Homo genus, you know, uh, to use stone tools of some type. Uh, which were crafted from stone they found. They may have used also other things too, like wood, you know, antlers maybe as tools uh, also as well. And uh, I think the Leakeys, like Louis Leakey, his wife Mary Leakey, they're the ones that kind of instrumental in finding a lot of these early fossils uh, in East Africa, Tanzania being one of the first places uh, they found them. Uh, and um, the name Homo habilis meant Handy, handyman, some people say sometimes skilled man uh, also as well. Uh, but they basically would make tools. Uh, and the tools had uh, a nickname. Um, They're called either a chopper or a pebble chopper because they would take uh, the actual stone and they would strike it against rocks to give it, give it an edge uh, so that they, they could then uh, cut up things like meat or whatever. And so Homo habilis would you know, end up supposedly being one of the first meat eaters. Uh, so man starts eating meat uh, as well. And uh, the, the pebble choppers were, were part of a tool industry back then uh, that was called Alduin. Uh, and I think the dating of Homo habilis, it varies, but I know as far back in Africa, they lived maybe around 2 million years ago. I don't think they ever left Africa, Homo habilis, uh, as a culture. Uh, but um, Homo habilis on average is about, I think the average male was maybe about five feet tall with a brain size that was larger than a chimpanzee. So the brain size starts getting larger. Uh, also, uh, one thing that is interesting about Homo habilis, you start seeing too, they start getting brow ridges above above the eye sockets. So the brain's getting larger, uh, probably increase in testosterone too as well. Uh, and um, so they're getting stronger, bigger, taller, you know, uh, early, early humans at that time. So, so that's the first really homogenous they really talk about uh, that developed a long time ago. And yeah, I think they say around where that Alt 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 Gorge in Tanzania is where they found some of the first Homo habilis fossils uh, that's there. Uh, they also got Homo erectus, uh, who came, sometimes called Homo ergaster and other names. Uh, they call this early human as well. And um, the um, Homo erectus, 
they first found a lot of the fossils of that particular early Homo genus uh, in back in the 19th century, 1800s. So it's found, probably found before Homo habilis was. Uh, and uh, the name Homo erectus means, by the way, upright man uh, or man that stands upright. Uh, and um, Homo erectus, they called him that because he was considered the first uh, Homo genus uh, to walk upright. Uh, so stand up on two feet, basically, because they think early, early primates and humans uh, walked on all fours, basically. And uh, Homo erectus was very famous uh, in Africa and later in Europe and Asia uh, for being big game hunters. They, they kind of start the whole hunter-gatherer culture. Uh, and so that's part of why they migrated from Africa, because they were, I guess, chasing after game nomadically, which took them to parts of the world. And uh, they were known for living like in huts and caves uh, throughout parts of the world. And um, migration period varies, but I think they think one to two billion years ago, they have already pretty much migrated uh, into different parts of uh, Asia and Europe. Uh, and they're kind of around until 200 something thousand years ago uh, at one point. So they're around the longest. Out of, I guess out of a lot of the early, I guess, early ancestors of humans, they had the most, you know, influence uh, later on. Uh, they are known for uh, new technology. That's one thing about Homo, Homo erectus uh, that's big. Uh, they, of course, one of the first to start using fire, which fire may have started a million years ago or more. Uh, so humans started using fire, which fire could be used, obviously, to cook their food. Uh, warmth, obviously, uh, scare wild animals away, uh, things like that. Uh, also, they had their own tool industry they developed, which was later called Achillean. Uh, and um, they were the ones that were the first to develop the so-called stone hand axe. And also, they probably one of the first to develop the spear, and the spear later leads to the throwing spear, uh, which is the addle addle, which you may have heard of. And um, here, of course, is examples of a stone hand axe, which you use it in your hand, which is why it's called that. And so obviously you can see here, they would take a piece of rock and they would uh, break an edge off on it using like stone. And they would hammer away with the edge until they would, create a sharp point and edge to it, uh, which you can see you can use it in your hand. Uh, and of course, over time, as you know, I, I guess by, I want to say Neolithic times, they'll even start adding a handle to it and things like that and putting obviously attaching like a spear with it to uh, also as well for hunting and so on. So Erectus, Erectus is real important. You know, that, that particular early early human, you know, really influenced other humans later, most likely culture-wise. Culture I do have some pictures of some of the early, uh, other ones they have later, too, as well. Um, so, yeah, they think after Homo erectus, of course, I'll get to it later, but uh, there is a later human, Heidelberg man, you may have heard of Heidelberg man, uh, which they think was some kind of human uh, between Homo erectus and Neanderthal man. Then you got Neanderthal man, and then you got the Homo sapiens, like Cro-Magnum man, et cetera, uh, that you have. And so you can see that, obviously, there's some kind of evolution of human development going on over time, which some of this could be obviously influenced by environment, or environmental changes and changes in their diet and uh, things like that over, over a long time period of time, of course, we're talking about. I do have examples of some of, the, if you go back up here, uh, the most, one of the most famous um, Homo erectus fossil uh, that was found, so that's called Homo ergaster, actually, uh, is Turkana boy, uh, which was found in 1984. Uh, this is, of course, a famous uh, Homo erectus fossil uh, that was found in northern Kenya, between Kenya and Ethiopia, uh, near the what is the shores of Lake Turkana. Uh, it used to be called Lake Rudolph. Richard Leakey, of course, was one of the sons of um, Lewis and Mary Leakey. Leakey's a real famous, if you know about him. Uh, very famous paleoanthropologist, archaeologist. We got Lewis, Mary Leakey, Richard Leakey, uh, Philip Leakey, Louise Leakey. Uh, and, and of course, Richard had a wife named Meve, 
Meave leaky, I guess, later uh, had as well. So the leakings are pretty famous. A lot of this early paleoanthropology in East East Africa. But um, so, yeah, it's one of the most famous, like intact Homo erectus uh, ever found. So you can kind of see that the skull, human skull, is kind of similar to later humans. Not that much different, I think, except maybe the, I think the jaws were a little bigger and I think they have heavier brow ridges uh, than later humans do, of course. Uh, also, Java Man, I don't know if you heard of that one. That was considered one of the earliest erectus fossils, supposedly found in the late 19th century uh, by Eugene Dubois uh, on the island of Java in Indonesia. So they, they found some there, and there's even some, like, um, I think they found fossils of Homo erectus uh, living there up to even later times, like even down to like when Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon man are living, believe it or not, because they found some that were like dwarfs, like these dwarf Homo erectus that are kind of real short that they found there. But I think the average um, Homo erectus is about five foot six, the males. Uh, also in China, they found later in the 1920s, maybe in the 30s too, uh, Peking man. Uh, these were Homo erectus fossils. Uh, they were found in a cave system in the Yellow River Valley. And uh, they think that some of these fossils may have, may date back to seven, 800,000 years ago. Uh, so you do have, like I said, you know, uh, early humans like living that far east uh, into like parts of Asia. Uh, then, of course, uh, I want to get into and talk about uh, Neanderthal man uh, as well. Neanderthal man, of course, uh, is another uh, important early uh, archaic human or early human uh, that's vital uh, with, you know, early human fossil record uh, in general. And uh, they're called different names. Usually a Neanderthal or Neanderthal lenses, you know, is the common scientific name uh, that's actually used. I would say Neanderthals or Neanderthal humans. Actually, the H is silent. It's Neanderthal, I actually say it. But um, this is a type of early dominant human that lived peak-wise about 100 to about 200,000 years ago, uh, mostly living in Europe, uh, southwestern Asia, and also part of North Africa uh, as well. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, Neanderthals were very famous uh, for their uh, Mousterian st uh, stone tool industry. Uh, they, they basically started making a lot of stone tools out of flint. And as you know, you can use flint to make fire if you rub stone together, that kind of thing. Uh, they were also known for living in caves a lot, especially in Europe. Uh, they found a lot of caves there where Neanderthals lived. Uh, also, they did have early cave paintings uh, as well, uh, which they're more primitive compared to later humans, like the Cro-Magnum culture uh, that comes in later in Europe as well. Uh, why were they called Neanderthal? Where apparently in the 1850s, they found the first fossils, uh, I guess in caves uh, in Germany, a place called Neanderthal, which means in German, Neander Valley. Uh, and so after that, they started using that term to describe uh, the culture. And uh, Neanderthals, um, uh, the culture was like big on hunter gathering. So it was a big hunter culture. Uh, a lot of the men uh, were kind of stocky, like maybe probably about five foot six on average, uh, might have been the height. And uh, one thing that the um, Neanderthals are very famous for, uh, they had one of the largest brain sizes of any early human uh, or any human, I guess, that developed. So I think the brain size of an average Neanderthal was like 14 to 16, 14 to 1600 cubic centimeters, which I think the average human is about 12 to 1400 range. So yeah, you can see that they're, their, um, their skull was kind of, was known for having its large uh, brow ridges uh, that are like larger compared to ours, you know, above the eye sockets. And another thing too is kind of a replica of one, but uh, you can see that they had a lot larger jaw. Uh, so obviously they were heavy meat eaters uh, in those days. And um, they also probably were stocky like that because they lived in kind of a cold climate because back then they were living like during the ice age and all that. So obviously the stocky body and that larger brain uh, helped to keep, you know, their body warm 
uh, in colder times. Uh, they think over time uh, what happened with Neanderthal man was that uh, they believe it went extinct, that particular species. Uh, how it's related to later humans, that's kind of debated. It's kind of controversial. Uh, there's a debate about how they're related. Are they like a separate species or probably more like a subspecies of early humans? Uh, but they do think that sometime between 30,000 to about 10,000 years ago, uh, they think they went extinct because of competition uh, with er er later humans that, that came in that were more dominant, uh, which, of course, are Homo sapiens. And um, I think there's a location, if you go to uh, where Gibraltar is, by the way, uh, there's a place called Gorham's Cave you may have heard of. I suppose that's one of the last locations of where they found some of the last Neanderthals that may have survived uh, from a long time ago. So obviously they were basically uh, went extinct due to just better competition from better humans that were maybe smarter, you know, but I think a long time ago, they used to say that Neanderthals were brutish and dumb, but now they seem to think that that's not true anymore, that they had some kind of language and that they were pretty intelligent. Uh, I guess to last that long, they had to be. Uh, several hundred thousand years or whatever. And that's, of course, you have next. You've got, you know, the, the of course, you can see here the difference between these so-called Homo sapiens, you know, and the Neanderthal, of course, on the left uh, that you've got. So you got your Homo sapiens coming in, uh, which Homo sapiens, of course, is a name that means wise man or thinking man. Uh, these, of course, were the original ancestors of modern humans that eventually developed in Africa, and then later migrated uh, into other parts of the world, Europe, Asia, and the Americas. And um, you can see they were like, the skull was a lot more smoother, more flatter face. Uh, their frame was more skinnier, not as stocky uh, compared to uh, Neanderthal humans, which could have been caused by a different climate, you know, and so on. And maybe even their diet or whatever may have also influenced it. Uh, as well. But um, the one that um, they talk about early on that was real important was Cro-Magnum Man. Here's a Cro-Magnum Man skull, of course, from a long time ago. And uh, Cro-Magnum Man were a type of early human culture that lived predominantly in Europe, uh, which dated back, they think, roughly 30 to 50,000 years ago uh, when they may have started. And um, if you know much about Cro-Magnum man, they were kind of like a hunter-gatherer culture, uh, just like Neanderthal man was uh, also as well. They lived in caves, just like they did uh, as well. However, uh, they were more advanced, uh, if you see culture-wise, with cave art uh, in general. That's one thing they're very famous for, uh, Cro-Magnum culture, uh, especially in the upper Paleolithic era, uh, which I'll get to later. Uh, you get all these different caves that they find later, mostly in Europe, like those two in France, like the Cro-Magnum Cave in France, found in 1868. And the Lascaux Cave, uh, which was found in 1940, is probably considered one of the most famous Stone Age art uh, ever discovered, uh, which was found near the village of Montanac, uh, which is in the southwestern part of France. Uh, and some of these cave paintings, by the way, date back you can see, I think that one dates back, I want to say, 17,000 years ago, uh, where it depicted a lot of the animals that they hunted uh, at the time. Uh, I do have a short video uh, that I'll show, of course, about, about that discovery in 1940, which, by the way, happened during World War II, which is interesting. This story takes place in 1940. To give it more context, it was right at the start of the war. Sunday, the 8th of September, 1940, starts with a boy called Marcel Rabidat, nicknamed the convict, who with his friends discovered the entrance to the Lascaux Cave. 
On this day, he had gone after his dog, who had chased a fox or a rabbit, when he kicked a stone with his foot, and it tumbled down into this little hole and made an echo that brought everyone running. And so the little group gathered around the hole and immediately thought back to the legend that had been told for generations, a story of an underground passage that was said to exist between the Montagnac Castle and a manor house just at the foot of the hill, known as the Lasco Manor. Anyway, they were not able to explore it that day because they didn't have a torch. They left, saying, we'll see later, but we need to go back and explore this famous underground passage. Four days later, Marcel Ravidat fashioned himself a torch and a knife, but none of his friends wanted to come along. On the way, he met three other boys from the village, Jacques Marcel, George Agnel, and Simon Quancas. So, he convinced them to come with him. And so it was these four who simply unblocked the entrance. It took them a good hour to do it, because they couldn't get through at all. By clearing the entrance, it was Ravidat who succeeded in making his way in head first. And all four began exploring the first hall little by little. So, the first painting that they saw was the red cow with the black head that is to the left at the entrance of the Axial Gallery. Then, they began making discovery after discovery on the walls. A bull here, a horse there, a line of deer, and so on. The initial shock for them was aesthetic. Then, there was a second shock that I refer to as a mystical or cultural shock. What was it? They didn't know. On the other hand, the images spoke to them. There were bulls, horses, deer, animals that they recognized. But they had no idea of the age or why they were there. So they tried to keep the cave a secret. Their idea was to tell their old teacher, Leon Laval, who immediately recognized the site as prehistoric. Laval said they had to speak to Abbé Breuil, who was the greatest expert in prehistory of the era. On the 22nd of September, barely nine days after the discovery, they were lucky enough to have the cave authenticated by Abbé Breuil. In the ensuing hubbub, crowds of journalists arrived to make it national and even international news. So yeah, anyway, that's so-called, I guess the Hall of Bulls, I think they show that part of that Lasco cave, uh, that's well known. By the way, Candace, hey, I don't know if I said good afternoon, but hey, what's going on? Uh, but anyway, yeah, the Lasco cave, that's that's pretty famous, uh, all because of a dog named Robot, you know, that found, I guess, helped find it or whatever, that kind of thing. So yeah, those kind of things were something that was kind of famous for a lot of the early Stone Age culture uh, back in those days. So I'm going to call, also talk about today. I need to, to discuss the um, the um, different periods uh, of human culture. I need to get into that today uh, and talk about um, how they divide up. You know, the I guess the prehistoric times and you know I really got into that, but I'll kind of go into that. And of course, I'll also talk about the metal ages uh, that they have uh, also as well. Uh, yeah, the Stone Age uh, originally was uh, divided into, uh, well, actually just two originally in the 19th century, which is Paleolithic and Neolithic, which uh, Old Stone and New Stone Ages, uh, which, by the way, was developed by this Englishman named uh, John Lubbock uh, in, I think, the 18, I want to say 1850s, I believe is when it was. And later, somebody else developed another Mesolithic part, which is kind of controversial, that kind of, they say, kind of might occur between the two, or I guess a transitional period between the two. That's how they usually break down the Stone Age, because, uh, you know, back then, that's all the main technology was, a stone at the most, uh, that, that early humans used. Uh, you can see it's quite vast, Paleo Paleolithic Age or era, you know, goes back two, three million years ago. Two and a half million, I think, is about when they say it starts uh, during what they call the Pleistocene Epoch. Uh, and um, during that time, uh, humans mostly um, hunt and gather. That's how they survived. Lived in caves or huts uh, back then, like you saw the back then early humans living in caves. That Lasco cave goes back to the Upper Paleolithic, you know, before I guess the Neolithic comes in later and all that. But um, 
So yeah, that's the common culture that uh, early humans uh, lived in. Uh, then they think that maybe there was this transitional period, like a Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age that kind of comes more like the end, I guess, of the Paleolithic Age, uh, where uh, hunting starts moving down more towards maybe farming. They're starting to gather food and uh, wild plants and things like that. And uh, they think early farming might might start going because of like climate change at the time. And then you've got the receding ice age uh, that kind of comes in uh, about the same time overall, because by that time you get about 11 to 12,000 years ago, you get the Holocene epoch uh, that comes in. The Holocene epoch is the current geological time that we're in right now. Uh, and this occurs, they say, after the last glacial period or last ice age ended, a long time ago, which would, I guess, put it about somewhere between nine to nine, I guess it's about nine to 10,000 BC, uh, they think, the last glacial period is. Uh, they think that's also where the continents kind of, I think, start to pretty much separate uh, after that uh, overall. The Holocene epoch in which we're in right now is more of an interglacial period. It's kind of like a period between ice ages and uh, some some scientists think that one day the ice age is going to come back. You have gla glaciers coming back, and that's why we still get all these harsh winters. You know, still in the winter time because you still got ice on the north and south poles and all that uh, coming down or bringing in, you know, cold air that brings in a lot of snow, etc. Ice. Uh, then of course you've got the Neolithic period uh, that you have, uh, which um, so-called new stone age or new stone, stone era that you have. And that's when human culture, like I said, transitions to farming, like agriculture is one of the main things, uh, which is the main revolution that really gets humans to develop civilization later. And so humans start realizing they could just domesticate animals, right? Instead of hunting them uh, as much, they probably still hunt you know, here and there, but uh, obviously, that's just supplemental uh, to feed them uh, besides, you know, growing crops and raising animals. Uh, and that, of course, leads into settlement uh, where cities and villages uh, being formed. So you get urbanization is you know, something that you, you see uh, that will eventually start later uh, where humans start developing that also uh, as well. And so along along with that, you know, you've got, you know, humans developing things like, you know, written language, uh, pottery being used, uh, new kinds of technology. I think the, the wheel and other things start coming in. Early metal is also starting to be used. I think copper is one of the first metals they start using and eventually they'll figure out how to make bronze uh, and so on. That's the other thing you talk about too, uh, is the so-called metal ages uh, that you have uh, as well, which is kind of part of the prehist prehistoric uh, history period that kind of comes later uh, as well. Uh, so you got like the, the three main periods you've got, uh, which uh, you've got the Copper Age. Is that, there was a Copper Age. I mean, they talk about the Bronze Age and Iron Age, the main metal ages that they have. But there was a brief Copper period where humans first developed Copper maybe about 7,000 years ago or so. Um, I think maybe about 5,000 BC or something like that. It, actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's about right. 5,000 BC, five to maybe 3,000 BC, I think is kind of the peak period where copper is used along with stone. Uh, and so they often call that period the so-called Chalcolithic era or copper stone age, uh, right before the Bronze Age comes in. And around 3,000, maybe going down to close to maybe 1,200 BC, uh, you've got the Bronze Age. Uh, where they figure out uh, that you can add tin to copper, you know, about 20% tin or so uh, with copper, and you get a stronger metal. So a lot of your Bronze Age cultures like the Egyptians, Babylonians, etc., are kind of living in that particular age. An Iron Age uh, maybe starts after 1200 B.C. and goes down to the time of the Romans, uh, maybe 500 A.D. or C.E. It's about maybe when they think the Iron Age ends. 
And so iron becomes the main best technology uh, that you have later. So I think they say the main groups that are considered the ones that were the most famous that were in the Iron Age were the Assyrians, uh, the Greeks, the Persians, the Romans. Uh, they would kind of be in that particular human era, human cultural era uh, that you have later. After that, you got the Middle Ages, you know, and then you get more in the modern periods uh, that you have, of course, uh, later. Uh, they do have this thing called the three ages. I don't think you really know about that, but a lot of people will often break it down into stone, bronze, and iron ages. I don't know if you know about that. You've heard of that before, but some people do that too. Uh, but they have all these sub periods that they have, like in the stone age. And uh, the metal ages did have the copper one too, but it's just not seen as being really that important overall. Uh, let me also talk about uh, another thing I need to get into today, I need to talk about, like I said, urbanization. I'll kind of get into and talk about some of the early human type villages or cities that were the settlements they think they were first developed, which some of the earliest sites go back about 1200 to about nine, 12,000, about 9,000 years ago. I've got pictures to show some of these, which were very famous, but Jericho, if you heard of Jericho, Jericho. Uh, is considered to be one of the oldest Neolithic sites uh, that has ever been discovered, which dates back to about 10,000 BC. So that roughly makes it about 12,000 years ago. And Jericho is a uh, Neolithic site that's located in Palestine, uh, like next to Israel uh, in the West Bank. It's basically where the new city, newer city of Jericho is today. And uh, the actual name they call it is Tel S. Sultan. Uh, is the actual name of it. Uh, and um, they think this is considered one of the oldest sites uh, where humans may have settled at one point uh, from a long time ago. Uh, and uh, Jericho, uh, they think, was a site that may have been about 10 acres in size, uh, roughly. The actual name means, by the way, it's an Arabic name, which means Sultan's Hill, because it was built on top of some kind of um, hill or a tell. Uh, and... Um, they believe it started out as a hunter-gatherer site, uh, but over time it was used for like farming as a type of agricultural village, I guess. But it wasn't that large. Apparently, they, I think what, what I've seen is that they think it may have had as many as two to 3,000 inhabitants back then uh, during the Stone Age. So it's considered one of the oldest sites where humans have been living a long time. And as you know, Jericho is famous for its famous wall, the Wall of Jericho, uh, which is mentioned in the Bible. So I think they say dates maybe to 8,000 B.C., which is kind of debated, uh, which that might be part of the wall that may have been there uh, at one point a long time ago. So it is an interesting site, Jericho, uh, that's well known, or Tel El Sultan, which is the archaeological site from a long time ago. Uh, there's another one that's very famous, which is located in Turkey. Uh, which is Gopekli Tepe, uh, which means in Turkish pot belly hill because of the shape of the hill that it's kind of right there next to. And it was discovered in the 1960s in the southern southeastern part of Turkey. I think it's where it's about located. And uh, its its dating is varied, but I see anywhere from eight to maybe eight to ten thousand BC. I think it's been debated how old, how old Gopekli Tepe is. Uh, roughly, but they think it was some type of site that may have been used as some kind of a temple or holy sanctuary uh, that was there a long time ago, where they uh, they think they may have, like early humans there, may have sacrificed animals uh, to various gods that they worshipped because they found uh, actual carvings of uh, animals on the actual columns that they think held up the temple uh, at one point. And um, they think the pillars, or some people call it megaliths, that, that kind of held up the temple, uh, may have been as heavy as 20 tons, which is like equal to something like 40,000 pounds. Uh, so it's kind of like almost like Stonehenge, you know, I think which dates back to 2000 BC, which is also famous for its megaliths uh, as well in England. That's a very mysterious site. A lot of a lot of historians still, you know, don't know much about it because uh, it was just recently discovered about 60 years ago.
uh, roughly, but they keep finding like some of these new sites uh, here and there. Uh, there's another one they have too I'll mention as well that's real famous called Katal Huyuk. You may have heard of this one uh, as well. Uh, and um, this is a, another Neolithic site that's located in Turkey also as well. I'll blow it up for you right here. But it was found in 1961. Uh, the actual name means in Turkish fork mound. So I think of the way the shape of the mound is in a fork shape to it, basically. I've got other pictures of it, but they think it dates back to maybe about 9,000 years ago or 7, 000, 7 to 8,000 BC, I think is about the range of maybe when it peaked as a culture uh, at the time. Uh, they were known for their uh, mud brick hut dwellings, uh, where uh, kind of strangely, if you look at this picture here, uh, they had doorways that were actually uh, in, in the ceiling. But they would climb down, I guess, using a ladder or something like that. Use a combination of wood, looks like wood and mud brick to build these buildings here. I think they think they may have put things on the walls, tapestry paintings or something like that. Maybe that's like kind of like the Minoans or some culture they have later in Europe. But um, it's a very interesting site. Uh, it's a pretty large site, too. I think it's one of the largest uh, at roughly about 32 acres in size. So it's a pr pretty big compared to, say, Jericho, I think, which is only about 10 acres in size. So three times bigger uh, than that one. Uh, it is a site that's protected by the um, UN. That's a UNESCO site, if you know about that uh, overall. Uh, they have another one that's also famous, which was found later in, in what is uh, Jordan. It's kind of an image of what they think it looked like, which is called Ein Gazal or Ein Gazal. I think it's pronounced Ein Gazal, I guess, so they say it, which, by the way, means in Arabic, the spring of the gazelle. Uh, it was found in the 1970s near what is Aban, which is the capital of Jordan. They think it's pretty old, too, dating back to probably over 7,000 B.C. Uh, they think they may have also built buildings that were kind of similar like mud brick, which is built a lot throughout the Middle East. Uh, and um, one thing about the uh, Angazal site that's well known, they're very well known uh, for making these um, stat human statues, uh, which I think are called different names. I believe they're called um, plaster and reed statues. I think they're called the Ein Gazal statues, but they're figurines of, of, of like humans, um, almost like mannequins in a sense, uh, showing humans, some animals uh, that date back to about uh, six to 7,000 BC. So that'd be about eight to 9,000 years old. They're made of lime plaster and reed. And some of them even have like two heads on one, one statue, which is kind of weird. Uh, but um, it's kind of like an early statue art you know, that you start seeing later, uh, later in ancient times. So those are some of the oldest sites that they found, you know, that are throughout, I guess, going back to the Neolithic period. But all these areas, you know, they're, they're starting to farm, you know, uh, throughout the world. Now, I've got a few minutes uh, left. I'm going to also talk about today because uh, we'll be getting into it later, about the River Valley civilizations. I need to mention about that uh, because, you know, that's one thing that, you know, humans start doing. They start transgressing towards uh, developing agriculture near fresh water sources, which are, of course, mostly rivers. And, yeah, the four River Valley civilizations, which you can see there, are obviously Mesopotamia, uh, which is Iraq. Uh, you've got India. Uh, you've got China. Uh, and, of course, you've got Egypt right there. Uh, and um, Mesopotamia, it, of course, is the oldest. It dates back, they think, as far as maybe eight, eight to 10,000 B.C., I think, is usually where they kind of put it. Uh, that's how old it is. I think sometimes because of Jericho, they kind of put it back to maybe 10,000 B.C., possibly. But it's based around uh, two, two river valleys, which are the Tigris and, of course, the Euphrates rivers, which are primarily start up in Turkey and Syria, they drain into Iraq uh, today. 
Uh, India's in South Asia, uh, so it's not quite as old, so five, 6,000 BC range. Uh, it's based around two rivers, the Indus River, which is mostly in Pakistan and northern India, and the Ganges or Ganja River, uh, which is in eastern India and Bangladesh. Uh, the China, China, Chinese, of course, culture, uh, also called the Yellow River Valley Civilization, is based in eastern China, uh, along with what they call the Wang Ho, uh, which is what they call the Yellow River in China. So it's not quite as old you know, compared to some of the other two right there before, but they usually date it to be about six, 7,000 years old. Uh, and then Egypt uh, is considered uh, the fourth one, of course, uh, the Nile River Valley located in the northeastern part of Africa, as you know. It only dates back to five, 6,000 years ago. Uh, but for a long time, you know, Egypt was considered one of the first great civilizations that you have. But you can see here kind of a map showing you uh, where all these different civilizations are. So you got Egypt here, number one over here, of course, in Africa. You got Mesopotamia, the oldest, located right here. Uh, kind of like in the southwestern part of Asia. Of course, here's India located really in Pakistan, part of India uh, today. And then, of course, you've got China over here along the Yellow River or Wang Ho uh, as well. They also got the Yangtze, but the Yellow River is considered like the mother river of where China, you know, really started back then. So anyway, that's kind of kind of giving you kind of a background, uh, you know, of what we'll be talking about later. Uh, when we get more into historical sources, uh, you know, uh, on, on ancient times, because uh, like later, you know, this week and next week, I'll, of course, be getting into uh, talking about ancient Mesopotamia. It's going to be one of my first areas I'll kind of go into uh, first, uh, which I'll talk about. I know on Friday this week, I'll kind of get into like the Sumerian culture mostly, which is considered one of the oldest cultures that developed in Mesopotamia. Uh, and then later, I think later, into, I think, Next week sometime, I'll probably even start getting into like some into Egypt uh, as well. And that's one of the first two topics I'll kind of get into uh, before I get into like India and China, you know, later in the semester. So uh, that's my main lecture for today. Uh, before we go, I did want to remind you, uh, don't forget uh, about the fact that, you you know, you've got the um, pre-test. you got to get that done. Uh, I think that's, like I said, I kind of moved it up uh, to being due uh, Thursday night. Uh, at midnight, uh, so try to get that done. Contract policy page, of course, also try to get that in uh, also as well uh, to me. Also, you know, keep sending me, you know, information like, I guess what book report you want to, book, book, book you want to do for your book report uh, for the semester. And if you're still interested in the Veterans Project, you know, uh, let me know uh, also as well. So, I don't think we have any comments, questions right now. But like I said, you know, you can pretty much, you know, anytime you want, leave me comments, questions, some kind of historical question about something you, you, you have. And even something else, uh, you can ask me about it. Uh, that's good as well. Maybe you do get bonus point points for comments, questions, of course, uh, on my YouTube channel. And uh, so that's pretty much it for today. I know Friday, like I said, I'm going to move on to talk about ancient Mesopotamia. So I will send out later announcements, links about that uh, later in the week uh, on what's upcoming, of course, for that. So that's it for today. I uh, hope you'll have, like I said, a first, you know, first week, great first week of school uh, at BRCC uh, and all that. Uh, and, um, and I'll see you, of course, uh, later. So y'all take care.